Good morning. Let's get started to, uh, to talk about boundaries this morning. First of all, congratulations. It's 8.30. Y'all are here. That's pretty cool. Oh, and by the way, if, if you haven't gone to sleep, it's Thursday morning. Welcome to Thursday. All right. So for, uh, for today's session, we're going to spend some time talking about boundaries. My name is Steve Rahi. I've been around Microsoft for 15 years. I've been working with Config Manager in various forms for uh, all that time. And you guys probably are, uh, uh, those who have been around that long are probably wondering, wow, Steve, boundaries, what a boring topic. Right? How can you make this interesting? How can you talk about boundaries for uh, 75 minutes? Well, we'll uh, work our way through that. Right? So here's the agenda of what we're going to cover. So I'm going to spend a lot of time at the first. So, so my challenge talking about boundaries is to make it interesting for all of you folks in the room. So by show of hands, who's brand new to Config Manager? Anyone? OK. And who's been around Config Manager for a while? Yeah. So all of you who just raised your hand, my job is to make it interesting to you as well and to the, uh, the new folks. So I'm going to spend a bit of time going through some of the basics, right? Because boundaries, the basics don't take that long to, co to cover. They are important, right? But then I'm going to spend the rest of my time showing you some applications of boundaries and how they work and why they're important and how understanding them can help you uh, do troubleshooting and, and that kind of thing. Right, so most of the time, again, will be spent in scenarios, showing you demos, right? But let's get the basics covered first. So I uh, just did this, familiar territory, right? Boundaries are critical. So very familiar territory, they are critical. So what is the job of boundaries? The job of boundaries is to carve up your network into manageable sections, right? Predictable, manageable chunks so that you know what kind of traffic patterns you're going to have, you know where clients are going to assign, and you can really control the way Config Manager works with your clients across your network. Right? That's, that's really the point of boundaries. They are critical to, uh, to have in place and to have configured well. Now, what about boundaries, right? So why do we care about boundaries? Really, it's two categories. The first is client assignment. So client assignment happens either manually. So really, there's four ways client assignment can happen. Either manually, you can specify the site that you want your client to join, and then boundaries don't matter so much. Or if you are in an environment where you want to use uh, client assignment equals auto or whatever, then we do leverage boundaries, and boundaries being configured properly is critical to helping your client know where to assign. All right. Little side note, so if you haven't seen it in Config Manager 2012, there is this option now to set a fallback site, which is really cool. So there have been issues in the past where you might have boundaries misconfigured trying to use client assignment equals auto, and the client would be perfectly healthy, but it never would assign anywhere because it didn't match a boundary, right? So under uh, hierarchy settings, I believe it is, there's now a, an automatic or a client fallback site. If you haven't seen it, take a look. And you can always tell it where to go when it doesn't match. So there are a few ways, if you are going to use boundaries, to set them so that clients can use them for assignment. The first is uh, AD. So if you have AD and you have AD extended and you have publication into AD, then the client, when it installs, will look at AD and find out, do I know where to install based on what's configured in AD? There's both local and cross-forest implications for this cross-forest new in Config Manager 2012. Beyond that, there is the, uh, the management point that we can seed into the client install process. There's a command line switch to allow you to tell the client which MP to go to. Once it knows which MP to go to, we can learn about the entire environment, know which client to, or site to assign to, and we're good to go, right? Again, basic stuff. And then you can also put the management point in DNS. The second item, and the more interesting one, frankly, to me, for boundaries, is the process of content lookup. And frankly, that's where we'll spend most of our time today, right? So as clients, and the reason this is interesting is because client assignment happens one time, right? If you assign a client to a site, 
it will never leave that site unless you tell it to, right? If you run a script on it, if you go manually change the site, all that's good, you can do that. That's the only time the client will change sites. Beyond that, it's the first time the client looks up the site, gets assigned to the site, and it's done. If you reinstall, sure, it's going to possibly change site then, depending. But that's it, right? So it's, it's a one-time thing, really, for client assignment with boundaries. But when you get into a content lookup scenario, that happens over and over and over and over again as clients ask for content from distribution points, as clients uh, ask for a location to store user state, during OSD, so in order of uh, uh, frequency, certainly the DP is the most frequent piece that we're going to look up. So the second piece is state migration point. And then you see this third one, the management point. So it's a, a common question with the new way that we do boundaries and boundary groups, which I'll show you in just a minute. Do you look up management points based on boundaries, based on boundary groups? Well, the answer is no, but the answer is also yes. And I'll explain that to you as we get further, right? So there should be an asterisk by the MP. Okay, I'll show you how that works as we get further along, okay? Now, in terms of options that we have for boundaries, there are really four, right? First is AD. So AD is really a, a cool option if you have the ability to rely on AD to, to correctly reflect your infrastructure. And oftentimes, I don't see customers that have that. You know, the other risk, if you will, of AD is that things could change on you and you might not learn about it until things had changed, right? So there is, uh, there, there's some good possibilities here. There's also some things to be aware of here. If you can leverage it, it's great. But in my experience, a lot of customers will prefer to go with more of an IP type boundary. So in the IP type boundary, there's three options. IP subnet, where you carve up an entire subnet and say this, this is a range or this is an, a section that I want to uniquely control, right? And it could be an entire subnet, a section of a subnet. We do subnet masking and all of that. Could be an IPv6 prefix. It could be an IP range. Now, in order of preference as to which of these you should use in the IP category, certainly IP subnets are far more preferable. They're less expensive from a performance perspective and generally can be implemented pretty well. IP subnet ranges, though, I'm sorry, IP ranges, you can leverage these if you need to, but be very careful with them because there is a significant increase in performance cost for an IP subnet or, or an IP range. Right? Now, does that mean you should stay away? No. Use them where you need to. They're there to help you solve certain problems. But just keep in the back of your mind, you know, use these with caution. So there's an environment that I know of as an example, pretty large environment, that had 4,000 of them. You know, it's, it's a convenient way to map out your IP territory or your, your, your network territory. The performance hit that they saw was significant enough to, uh, to really impact SQL even on a very beefy box. So be careful about that. And even if, if you do need to use a large number of IP ranges, you know, there are ways to do that and do it safely. But just be aware, this is a significant performance impact as they grow. If you just have a few, you know, big deal, you know, whatever, use your best judgment and, uh, and keep an eye on it, but still, just be aware. The recommendation is, uh, is definitely to use those sparingly. Now, in terms of twists and changes that come with, uh, with 2012, there are a few. So the boundary information, the reason I started with boundaries, how exciting, right, is because boundaries really haven't changed that much since they were introduced in SMS 2.0. They have changed some, right? Certainly they've changed a bit in, uh, in 2012, but they're not dramatically different. Here's a few twists. <clears throat> so boundaries themselves in previous versions of Config Manager, as soon as you put a boundary in place, it's actionable, right? In 2012, you can configure 200 boundaries and they do nothing, right? All they are is a library of options. So it gives you the opportunity to go configure the boundaries the way you would have them be 
but you don't make any real impact on your network until you actually put them into what's called a boundary group. And at that point, they become actionable, right? So what is a boundary group? Well, so a boundary group is, let me just show it to you first. This will probably be the easiest way. Let me move on um, here and show you what a boundary group is, the boundaries, a couple of things about it. So here's my lab. And in my lab, you see that I'm using subnet ranges. Yeah, sorry, it was easy for me to set this up in my lab that way, so I have a couple. Right? These don't do anything. There, there's nothing about these boundaries that do anything. In fact, if you'll think back to previous versions, whenever you look at all the boundaries in your environment, they will be associated with a site code. Right? These are not. So yeah, you'll see in the description where I have a given site code that I've put in that helps, oops, I keep doing that, I need to be on this machine, where I have a given site code that I put in to help me understand what these are, right? But there's nothing specifically that ties a boundary to a given site anymore. It's just a library. The way you make a boundary actionable is that you place it inside of a boundary group, okay? So the boundary groups are down here. So if we go look at the boundary group, I have two. One is for one site and the other is for another. Now, first of all, boundary group strategy. Well, let me go into this and I'll go back. So if you look at a boundary group, go to properties on it. The first choice you have to make is what boundaries you want to put in place, right? So you could have one boundary, you could have 10 boundaries, you could have five boundaries, whatever makes sense in a boundary group. Remember, the purpose of boundaries is to carve up your network into manageable segments, right? So in the boundary group, you're going to want to place boundaries together that you want to manage as a unit, all right? Well, then you have to say, what do you want to do with these boundaries? Well, what you do to, to make that uh, distinction is on the references tab. You have a choice. You can use boundaries for client assignment, all right? Or you can use them for content location or both, all right? So in my case, I'm using a single boundary group to say any systems that are on this given boundary, I want to assign to the site that I've listed and also, any machines that are on this boundary, I want to communicate with my distribution point that's in the list. Okay, again, what, what are boundaries for? Client assignment, uh, content lookup. So I'm going to specify distribution points that clients in this boundary region should leverage for content lookup. Now, what does that sound very similar to in Config Manager 2007 and I think SMS 2003? protected distribution points, right? It's exactly what this is. There's no difference, it's just a different way of presenting it to you. So protected distribution points is something that was available historically, would have been very advantageous for uh, many customers to use. I, I don't know all the reasons why, but in my experience, folks didn't leverage it that much. Now we put it here as a first priority. Right, that you do need to leverage it or, or at least consider it whenever you're building out your boundary groups. The default is to have all of your DPs set as protected, right? By adding a DP to a boundary group, what you're saying is that the only clients, now by default, I'll show you where the defaults don't apply as we get further along. What you're saying by default is that clients that are on a boundary that is in this boundary group, associated with this boundary group, those are the only ones that are able to talk to the distribution points associated with that boundary group, okay? So the second type of thing you could also put in here for content lookup is state migration points, all right, which I don't have, all right? So, so we'll stay with that. Now, you see that I've chosen to use a boundary group for both client assignment and content lookup. You can do that, but I don't recommend that. Instead, I would suggest that you have separate boundary groups for the purpose of client assignment, separate boundary groups for the purpose of content lookup. Here's why. So for those who've been around Config Manager for a while, you know that overlapping boundaries is a bad thing, 
right? For client assignment. Overlapping boundaries for the purpose of content lookup is absolutely supported. So if you use a boundary group for both things, which sometimes you can, but if you use a boundary group for both things, the potential is there to mix things up, right? And overlap unintentionally. Um, whereas if you separate them, you can really control that and, and make sure that you don't have those overlaps as much as possible. Right. So it could be that you have, you know, maybe you have one primary site. Could have one boundary group for the purpose of client assignment, 30 boundary groups for the purpose of content lookup, depending on your environment. Right, that's fine. This is where you configure them. Okay, one other thing. So I showed you, or I told you that you can also publish boundaries into Active Directory. And you can, so I'll just show you this real quick. The way that you uh, discover Active Directory, there's an AD forest discovery now that's new in 2012, and we will go out and learn about the various forests in your environment. Why? Because we now allow you to publish to the Active Directory of remote forests. So we have to learn about them somehow first. Once we know about them, then we can publish information about them, about our sites, uh, to those forests. So if I scroll down under site configuration, go to my CAS. In my publishing tab, here's where I tell it where I'm going to publish. All right, so I'm just going to publish my information to uh, Tailspin Toys, my domain name, and I'm good. All right, so that's, that's pretty much like it always has been. If I want to publish in a remote forest, uh, I, can, I would see it here if I, have, uh, if I had remote force, but you'll also see uh, down near the bottom. Oh, what am I looking for? There, Active Directory Forest. Any of those that I've discovered, I would show here, and then you could set publication of a site, all your sites, whatever, uh, on an individual discovered forest. Okay, so again, not to belabor that point, I could take you into AD and show you the systems management container that is created where we put all of our boundaries. I could dump it out and get all uh, geeky about that, but my real interest in boundaries is content lookup, so I'll spend my time doing that. Okay, so let's shift back for a minute. We'll come back to the lab shortly. So all that as far as basics, right? A few more things uh, in terms of basics or, or in, uh, in terms of precursor stuff. Are boundaries really necessary? Can you run totally without boundaries? You could, right? Back in the day, it's been a while since I tested it. Back in the day, I assigned a client to a site without boundaries. You could do that. In some cases, it might make sense for you to do that, but here's the thing. If you run without, most environments are not going to want to run without boundaries. In fact, it's not a supported thing. We haven't really tested that. And uh, don't recommend it, right? Because without boundaries, you don't really have the controls in place that you would have otherwise, right? You can't segment where traffic goes so easily, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, you, you really do need boundaries, though it is possible in some cases to run without them. You don't get all of the controls that, that we otherwise would give you. Do you need boundaries with just a single primary site? Well, again, very likely, yes, right? You don't need them for assignment, necessarily, but you do need them for carving up your network into manageable portions so that you know predictably where traffic is going to flow and where it's not, and where clients are going to come get content where they're not, right? So you need them there. Well, what about scenarios where you have, uh, I don't know, uh, very high-speed connections between your environments and you don't care at all, about those connections because they're so fast and you can have clients from Europe coming to the US and it doesn't matter. We all live in networks like that, right? Right? Right. We don't live in networks like that. If you have that, well, you know, hey, probably you can get by without boundaries so much, but even then, you're gonna have clients having to hop across multiple segments and trying to keep them local to uh, DPs. Still, it's a good idea. Now, there are some interesting environments where boundaries are, uh, are things you can more do without in some cases. So what about something like Branch Cache or 1E Nomad or Adaptiva, right? Those products that allow clients to do peer caching 
to one another. Do you need boundaries then? I don't know, right? In that scenario, it makes it less, less interesting for boundaries because now you have clients that are kind of being distribution points for their peers. They're not really that, but they're caching content for their peers. And so you expect the number of clients to come across to the DP to get content in the first place to be far reduced compared to your normal environment. So I know of an environment that runs in completely a fallback mode, which I'll explain what that means in a minute. And they don't worry about boundaries so much because they expect that because of the product they have in place, that clients are going to just come across maybe one or two from a given subnet, get the content, leverage it, then share it with their peers. They're very successful with that. Right? So the point is boundaries are very flexible. They can be whatever you need them to be to you know, significant controls to you know, whatever. If you have uh, third-party products, you can, you can adjust them accordingly. All right. Now to the fun stuff, boundary scenarios. So I want to go through and show you how boundaries are used in your environment. And as we go through this, the, the reason I want to kind of go through this is to show you, from a troubleshooting perspective, how boundaries can sometimes impact you, right? Uh, so first of all, I want to take you through client assignment. Again, I won't spend much time there, more just to highlight a couple of things in the log. And then I want to take you through a few scenarios. So the first scenario is going to be uh, how to uh, enable, well, so for example, fallback DPs, right? I'm going to talk to you about those. I'll define what they are. So there's the, the first scenario, which is the default, where we're in a protected DP scenario. We have clients that are on a given boundary that are going to communicate with DPs on their uh, in their boundary group and stay in the default config. Then there's a scenario we can enable called fallback, which I'll explain to you. Uh, then there's a distribute on demand scenario that we can enable, right, which I'll show you. And then here's a point for content lookup that you'll see throughout all of this, and I've already mentioned it. Boundaries, again, are not per site. They are per hierarchy. You can leverage boundary groups wherever you need them. And you'll see me do that as part of my demos. I can move them around, do whatever. And then as we go through this, for those of you who are familiar with previous versions of Config Manager and boundaries are not this new mystical thing for you, uh, the term roaming probably will come to mind as you see me going through some of these demos. We don't use the term roaming in Config Manager 2012 really anymore, but it really is roaming. Right? For those of you who understand what that means, it's a natural thought process. Right? And, and so I'll show you that. All right. So here are uh, a few things that we're going to go through. So the first thing that's important as I get into the lab that I'll show you how to set up is verbose and debug logging. For content lookup, it's going to be much easier on you to figure out what's going on if you have verbose and debug logging turned on. It's something that Again, for those who are veterans with Config Manager, it's probably maybe familiar. But if you don't know that it's here, it's, a, it's an interesting option that you can consider. Right? So for verbose and debug logging, to be honest, I prefer to have it on in every environment that I go in. Right Now, people disagree, and that's fine. Everyone has their own opinion. But it's important enough to be able to see the detail of some of the stuff going on on the client, especially in content lookup, but in other areas as well. And the overhead is so minimal on modern hardware, disk-based consumption so minimal on modern hardware, that to me it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you know, people disagree, that's cool. But uh, I'll show you how to enable it where you need it. You know, my thoughts on it are I'd rather have it turned on and available when a problem happens than have to turn it on, recreate the problem, and then go look at it, you know? So again, your opinion is fine, but, uh, but that's fine. So I'm going to take you to the client assignment, show you in the logs real quick um, how that works. Then I want to take you through uh, some of the demos uh, that I talked about with Content Lookup, and then finally wrap up talking about MPs. So here's the first one, Content Lookup. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, verbose and debug logging. So let me go into my client. I already have it turned on here, but let me go into my client and show you how to set it up. And by the way, there are command line options that you can use when you install the client to set this up if you want to. 
Or you can turn it on ad hoc, like I'm going to do here. This is where we'll have a bit of an eye chart, so let me get in place and I'll show it to you as zoom it. So here, you notice I'm positioned already. Let me do this. I'm already positioned in the key where you have to turn it on to start with. So this is, um, I'll tell it to you since you can't see it on the screen now. It's local machine software, uh, Microsoft CCM logging at global, right? There's a value in there called uh, log level. Log level by default is set to one, which is exactly opposite of what you would think it would be. One typically means turned on. No, nope, not here. One means disabled, normal level logging. To turn on verbose logging, you have to set it to zero, right? Or use the command line switch. So that's point one. Verbose logging is not enough for some things. You also need a piece called debug logging. So let me show you that one. So if I move on down, you have uh, to, to enable debug logging, you have to create a key called, strangely enough, debug logging right here and set the value in the key to enabled true. Those two things turn on verbose and debug logging. Now, it's going to put a lot more information in the logs, thus verbose and debug logging, right? But this is how you turn it on. You can turn it off if you want to later. That's fine, right? Um, whatever. Okay. So that's that. Now, let's go back and do uh, client assignment. So I have, uh, again, client assignment is something that happens very early on. It's just a one-time thing, really, uh, in many cases. So I've captured off some logs from the client assignment process for this box, right? And there's really two logs that I care about for client assignment. Let me show you. The first one is client location. So client location is where you're going to see the client actually get assigned, right? Well, then there's other processes that happen where the client goes through all of its work to become assigned, and you're going to see that in a log called location services. And we can go trace it on the server and do some other weird things, but I'll, I'll leave it at that for now, right? So let me show you, uh, first of all, client location. I'm going to look for key entry of text. So what you'll see here at the very top of client location is this entry that says assigning to site. So that's the first entry in the client location log after the client's installed, assigned, right, is a recognition that I'm going to assign to site PR2, done. Well, there's work that goes on to make that choice before we ever actually do the assignment. So that work you can see with, uh, in, the, in the location services log, and let me show you a neat little trick. So I'm gonna remember the text, assigning client to site. I can also go by timestamp. Timestamp is always our friend when we're looking in logs. But I'll remember assigning client to site. And I'm, I know that client location and location services are the logs that I care about. So what I'm going to do is go launch CM Trace. And I'm going to go open these log files. So first one is client location. And I'm going to scroll down to location services. Went past it. Come on. Right here. Hold down my favorite control key so I have both of them selected. And then merge these files. So what I care about is assignment to PR2. Right, so I'm going to go find my entry. said I was going to remember the text, and I don't. So I uh, will just search for PR2. There it is. Assigning client to PR2. Well, notice what happened. Here's my first entry for client location, but all of these happened first. So this is a neat little troubleshooting trick if you've never done it, right? So if you ever want to understand how a process works, you, and you have no idea where to start, that's what I have to do, and many of us have to do if we're trying to understand a process. You can do that work. You can cause the action to take place and then go grab the logs, merge them together like this, all the logs that have updated with the timestamp at the time, and you can kind of sift through it and figure out what happened. Right? This is a very easy illustration of that, of that process. So if I look up, and this is all I'm going to do, I mentioned 
that we're going to go and try to find information about the, uh, the management point the clients need to talk to in AD. So you see that happening here. Then we're going to roll over, try DNS, and then you know, look at our command line and different things. You see all of that happening. And then here we did actually find a management point. And that's the one we're going to use. And once we have it, that uh, we find the client's not assigned, and then we finally assign the client to site, right? So that's really it. Right? Again, client assignment is not that exciting to me. It happens one time. You can trace it backwards if you want to. But for, the, for now, that's all I'm going to do for client assignment. But it illustrates the point. All right. all right. So let me go back to my PowerPoint for a minute, and then we will, again, get into the fun stuff. So that's client assignment. Now, in terms of content lookup, Right, there are those three scenarios. I want to show you the first one, which is basic, where we uh, do what we do by default and stay within our boundary group and find the DPs there and uh, uh, our clients on the boundaries defined in the boundary group and so on. I'll show you how it works. Then I'll show you a couple more scenarios. Here, here's why I'm showing you this. Right? So boundaries are so pivotal to operations being successful in an environment. I'll tell you, I was out at a customer site a couple of weeks ago, and they were having all sorts of issues with patches not coming down, they weren't getting applied, they were having software deployment issues, they were just having all sorts of issues. And they thought everything was fine from a boundary perspective, but we went through, they had about a, a hundred systems that they identified that they wanted to look at. We went through 10 of them. Of those 10, nine of them failed because they could not find content. Now, there's various reasons that they couldn't find the content. Some of it was boundary related. Some of it was that the deployment to the distribution point had failed. But the point is, understanding this process I'm about to show you is huge in troubleshooting issues, right? And it's really not that complex of a, of a process, but if you haven't seen it, this is something that is applicable over and over and over again. So the process I'm gonna show you is the content lookup process. This process is applicable for software deployments, packages, applications. It's applicable for, for software updates. It's applicable for task sequencing, OSD, everything, right? So if you understand this process and can troubleshoot it and understand what you see, you'll be equipped to at least troubleshoot this perspective. Now, what I'm not going to do is show you all the precursor stuff that gets us into content lookup, because that would be a lot, right? At the, the mechanism by which we enter the content lookup portion of the deployment is different depending on which piece is doing it. So application deployment, you're going to have other components involved that call out and ask for content. Task sequencing, different com components involved that reach out and ask for content and so on. Right? So we'll just go jump directly to the content, see how it works. Well, to understand what you're going to look at, I need to show you how the lab is configured. Right? So the first thing is, here's my lab. I've got a CAS, and I've got two primary sites. This is PR2, it has a distribution point. This is PR1, it has a distribution point. This is the range, the IP range associated with this site, DP, by boundary group. Here's the IP range associated with this site's DP by boundary group. And you notice my client is assigned to PR2, and it's IP address directly falls within this boundary range. So according to this initial config at first, this is the classic scenario. This is the default scenario. Right? So let's go see how does content lookup work in this scenario. All right. Uh, actually, yeah. Sorry. I'm confusing the, uh, the system up here. All right, good. So now, to show you this, let me just show you some demos that I've got set up. Pretty simple demos, but they'll illustrate the point. So I've got three applications. The first one is a basic deployment of rich copy. Right? Very, uh, very standard stuff. Let me show you a few key areas. So the first one on the, uh, on the deployment, come on, right here. Notice this option. You'll see this again in a minute. Um, distribute the content to packages, uh, or for packages, to preferred distribution points, right? Now, we'll talk about this, and I'll show you this again in a minute, but what is a preferred distribution point? 
a preferred distribution point is one that the client knows about because it's associated with the same boundary group the client matches right now. It's, that's a preferred DP. It's your protected DP, to use old style terms. Right? That is not turned on. Right? Uh, this is for a distributed on demand scenario, which again, I'll show you in a minute. The other option is uh, under deployment types, edit, you will see uh, content, this other one, allow clients to fall back for locating content. Well, what does that mean? That's the second scenario I'll show you. It's not enabled here. I'll go into it again in a minute. But fallback means that you are not within the boundaries defined by your given boundary group. Therefore, you cannot leverage by default the DPs in your boundary group. So I'll cover that in a minute. But for this one, everything is normal. Everything is default. You don't have fallback enabled. You don't have distributed on demand enabled or preferred DPs. Right, so we're just going to do it normally. So I've, uh, I've got clients. The client has the content, so we'll go look at what it looks like. Now. Let me switch to my client. Here's a key. So you see that I have my cache folder here, and I'll zoom in to logs as I look at them, but this is my cache folder. My cache folder is empty. Making sure your cache folder is empty of content is absolutely critical to understanding how the content, process, uh, content lookup process works. If you have content that the client's downloaded in the cache, It'll never go ask for it from the DP because it has it locally, therefore you will never see the content lookup process, right? So here, I'm artificially deleting content from my cache, which means whenever I run it the first time, it's going to fail because I'm going to be yanking it from the cache and then running it again. So I'll, I'll, you'll see that in a minute, all right? So here, it's not in the cache. So let's go run it. So here's my basic deployment. So I'm going to go install this thing, and it's going to try, and it failed. So the next time, it should run. And here it goes, and it's downloading. I've got the content. Now it's in the cache. All right, here's my rich copy content. And it's good to go. It's installed now. So the question is, I'm going to uh, yank it from the cache again because I don't want it here. So the question is, what actually happened to acquire this content. Well, let's go look at the logs and find out. So again, I'm going to approach these logs from the point at which we start asking for content. And I do have verbose in debug logging turned on. Not only do I have it turned on on my, uh, on my client, I also have it turned on on my management point. So the process that I showed you for turning on verbose and debug logging on the client is exactly the same on the management point. It's no different. To see all this process all the way through, you really need it turned on on both. All right. All right. So the first component that comes along for looking up content is this component called CAS. Again, I'll zoom for it in a minute. But it's really a good idea to keep track of your timestamps as you're looking at these logs, especially as you're trying to track down some activity. So my client has been fairly uh, static for a while, and so I should get in my lab to the uh, very top of a processing loop very quickly, and you'll see uh, right around here is where we started to process this loop. So I'm just going to look through and see what we do. Let me zoom in a bit and see what we're doing, right? So what we're doing, I'm not going to go through this line by line, but what we're doing is we're starting the process to acquire content. Well, if you follow this in the first few lines, you're going to see that the CAS, client, uh, Content Access Service, is first going to try to check, do I have it in my local cache? If I do, groovy, I'm done. I don't have to do any more work. I'm going to just return that data, and we're good. Right? But in this case, I don't have the content in my cache, and so I've got to go look for it. And you'll see me do that in a minute. I'm going to, again, br brief. Uh, go, go through some of them. I'm not going to go every line through this. I'm going to hit the highlights. The other thing you see in your screen, which is interesting, notice about middle way down, requesting content, content underscore in this long, very user-friendly string of data, right? That is actually the process where we're beginning to ask for a rich copy. Well, how in the world would you know that at that stage, this content underscore actually means rich copy. 
One of the things in the logs, you will not very often see the actual name, user-friendly name of the content, of the package, of the deployment, whatever. Sometimes you will. More often than not, you will see the ID, much like this. So here is how you kind of correlate the two. So take a snapshot of content underscore 2F whatever, right? And then if I go back to my site, and look at the content, the deployment type, notice this content ID column right there. I'll zoom on it. Oops. I hit the wrong key, sorry. Notice this content ID column. I don't have zoom it. Hang on, let me minimize this and launch zoom it. Thought I had it there. Launch. Okay. Now it's working. Software library, do this the third time. Basic deployment type. And here is the exact same content ID. Right? So I can look at the log and I, oh, is this, I think this is the one that I'm actually trying to trace. Is it the one I'm trying to trace? Well, here's how you correlate it back, and yes, it is. Right, well, and there's other places as well that you will see unique IDs kind of in the, the process. This is not exactly related to content deployment, but I'll show it to you anyway. So if you go up and right click, you will see like a CI unique ID column up here. It's not there by default, but if you add it, you will see some of those unique IDs that are running through the logs that you otherwise would have no idea, oh, this means that, right? Okay, so let's go back to our client. So here we see that we're asking for content. Well, if you scroll down, we're preparing, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're requesting content now. Again, right here, we're starting to request it. Well, now let's go down and look at the actual request. So if I scroll down a bit, you're gonna see a location request. Let me find it. Here it is, right here. Actually, I'll highlight the line above it. Here's the location request, the two lines below my blue bar. We realize that the content is not in the cache, and we realize that we need to go get it. So what we're gonna do is ask for that content. Now, content access service basically is just requesting it, right? There's other process, processes that get involved with asking for content. I'll show you some on the MP side in a minute. But notice that the request and the reply are very close together. Go over here. Uh, usually within a second or two in my lab, right? So here certainly they're within the same second. They happen very quickly. Well, you wouldn't know necessarily by looking at this that we're actually asking the management point ultimately for this content, right? We don't know where it is. The management point does. So we have to ask the management point, where is this content? The management point doesn't know either, but it does have access to the database, so we can get, then go figure that part out. So let's look at this a little bit more closely. Let's look at the actual request that goes up, all right? So here's the request that goes up, this line of XML. So you'll see a number of things about this, including things like the package ID, that content thing, you'll see uh, that it's looking, you know, has settings for whether we allow distribute on demand, uh, allow uh, uh, my, uh, uh, Windows update for Microsoft updates, whether we're going to use protected, all these different triggers that are in here. Uh, the key thing that's interesting, though, is notice as part of the request, we're sending up what we're looking for, but at the bottom line right there in the middle of the screen, we're also sending up what our IP address is, right? Because again, we're trying to find distribution points that are local to us based on IP information, based on boundary information. We don't know where they are. We're sending up our details so that we can use that in trying to find the information. All right? So now we know that this is going to the management point. Let's actually jump ahead and look at the management point logs. So I'm gonna just connect to my management point. right here, all right, and I'm gonna go into my program files, logs directory, 
right here, SMS TCM, logs. So all of the management point logs, fortunately, begin with MP. And there's this one called MP location. Well, since we're asking for a location for distribution points, kind of stands to reason that we would look at MP location, and in fact, we do. So again, following our timestamp, and it's really easy in an isolated lab to follow these timestamps. I realize in a production environment, you have to be, it's a little bit more challenging because there's a lot of stuff going on, but it's still possible. So here's where we see the request coming in from the client, right? So we see the location manager starting up. We see the management point, the site code is P, uh, PR2. We see the client's name requesting it. Basically, we see the location request. So if we looked at that body, it would be, be exactly the same. Let me skip down in here. So this location request right here, that would be exactly the same as what I saw on the client coming up. We're going to unpack that. Here's the content ID, here's the uh, AD information, here's uh, the site it's assigned to, uh, on and on and on, right? Notification PR2 is uh, in the local site list, uh, we're, uh, and we're going to query for DP. So let me scroll down a little bit. So again, right about in the middle of the screen. So we're going to run, so, so there's two things that are interesting on this page. So the second line down, or third line, I guess, you see the, the word calling, and then you see MP underscore get local sites from assigned site. So this is a stored procedure, right? The management point doesn't store this information. This information could be fluid. It could change from one request to the next. In fact, it will in a minute, right? So we have to figure out, hey, where are we? Are we at our assigned site? Whatever. This is not really looking at the content per se, but it's part of the process. Then if you look down uh, about, I don't know, six lines or whatever, you'll see another one called MP underscore get content DP info unprotected. We pass in all of this information uh, for our content that we're looking up into this stored procedure. This stored procedure is going to run and return back to us data about what distribution points are available to us based on the information we've supplied forward. All right? Now, we're either going to get a response or we're not. If we don't get a response, the client basically says, hey, I don't have any distribution points. I'm not running it. Goodbye. Right? So how do you know whether you get a response? Oh, by the way, as I scroll down a little bit, you'll see um, the reply body at the very bottom last line reply message body, we send back the reply to the client about what we found, right? So let's go back to CAS log on the client, and we'll see that exact message. Close this down. Actually, I'll, yeah, I'll close this down. So here's the reply body. So we sent it up. We asked for content. We're going to get a reply. Here it is, all within the span of one second. And notice that in this reply body, we have a bunch of things. We have the uh, hash algorithm to make sure the content's valid. We have the site. We have the content. We see which distribution point. So the fourth line down, that's our distribution point that we're able to use for the content. I just have one DP. That's all that I return. You could have several, right? And then the very last line, let me highlight it here, and then I'll zoom it up again. Notice this entry right there. This is a very interesting entry. Locality, local. What that means is that we asked for content. We found that content on a DP that is in our boundary group. Therefore, it's local. Therefore, we can use it, right, based on our configuration. If we had not found a local DP, the client would not have used anything because we're not set to allow these other scenarios like distribute on demand or fallback. We're not set to, to honor that. So this would have failed, right? So here's the point. This flag, and you'll see, if I do my demos right in a minute, you'll see another value come into this entry in a minute. But this entry alone, you know, having this kind of information available to you, you can kind of get an idea. Why is this deployment, why is this client unable to run this content? Why can't it find it? Is it local like we think it's supposed to be? Or is it a laptop that's traveling and maybe my settings don't allow? for me to get it, or what is it, right? Do I have boundaries misconfigured? What is it? Now, this isn't going to answer the exact what is it, but it could tell you 
that you're, you're, what you're getting may, may not be exactly what you're expecting, right? Okay. So let's shuffle the deck a bit. So I'll have to come clean up my lab in just a minute, but let's, uh, let's shuffle the deck a bit, go back to the PowerPoint. Uh, that, that makes sense? You, everyone good? Cool. So let's do another scenario. So this is fallback. So in order to demonstrate fallback, I'm going to have to make a few tweaks in my lab. This is what I'm going to do. Right? So I still have the same sites, primary one, primary two. And notice all I'm going to do is I'm going to remove my range from my boundary group. The client's still assigned the same way, still going to have the same IP address. All I'm going to do is take my range away. And then I'm going to go through the process of enabling fallbacks, already enabled, but I'll show it to you, what that means, right? So when I take my range away, by definition, the client is now not within a boundary group, so it therefore cannot find DPs that are preferred, or to say it in old style terms, in this scenario, my client would be what we used to call roaming because it is not in a defined IP region right, or boundary region. So in that scenario, by default, again, the client will not be able to run content. Could be a hotel room. Some of you folks may be getting content requests now and you can't run them because you're in the hotel room, right? Or it could be that you're visiting a customer site or whatever it is, right? You're not in a defined region in terms of boundaries for, for running the content. So let's see how that works. So I'm going to go back to my lab environment. First thing I'm going to do is I need to clean up because, again, I've installed this, so I need to make sure the client knows that it's not installed. So the way I do that is, first of all, I'm going to go down to Programs and Features and Uninstall Rich Copy. And then I'm going to go back and tell the client to scan and see if that application uh, is there using our new application deployment reevaluation cycle, which is really cool, and uh, we'll go back and tell it based on, on detection logic for the app, the clients or the app is no longer installed, so we're back. The other thing that I need to verify, and I've already done it, but I'll just verify it again, is that my cache directory is empty, right? Just making sure that we have empty cache folders so we can download it again. Now. In addition to that, I need to make a couple of changes on my site and show you a couple of things. So on the administration node, I have my boundary groups and boundaries. So I'm not going to change the boundaries. All I'm going to do is change the boundary group so that this boundary group now doesn't have a boundary uh, range in it. I'm going to get rid of it. So this maps exactly to the diagram I showed you. A couple other things. I've already showed, kind of shown these to you. But again, fallback, enabling, allowing fallback is not default. You have to allow it, right? And there's two places, really three, but two places that you have to turn it on in order for it to work. So the first is on the distribution point itself. So if I look on a distribution point, here's my distribution point for my site and I look at boundary group, you will see this entry down here, allow fallback source location for content. So the first switch you have to have turned on is that the distribution point itself is allowed to be a fallback source location. So for those pieces of content you want to deploy when the client's not within its boundary group and doesn't know which DP to go to, you have to turn on fallback. Well, this one is enabled by default. Every DP you put out by default, will, unless it changed in SP1, I haven't looked, I don't think it has, will be enabled as a fallback location. Right? But fallback is not available by default. That's because there's a second switch that you have to turn on to make this work. So if I go back to my software library and look at uh, my fallback example, again, I'll go through it the same way. Notice I still don't have uh, this option available, which was the preferred. I'll show you this one. That's the third demo. 
All right, let me go edit this. So notice here on content, now I do have allow clients to use a fallback source for content. So this is something you have to have on the DP turned on. You also have to enable it on the deployment. So if you don't want to use it for a given deployment, cool. If you want to use it for others because they're critical enough, cool, up to you. Right? But this is not turned on by default. So now, once you have both of these turned on, it at least allows the possibility of a fallback condition. But it still won't work necessarily, right? Because there is a third option that you have to have turned on. Notice this one right down below it, the deployment option. So if you read the text, select the deployment option to use when a client is within a slow or unreliable network boundary or when the client uses a fallback source location for content. The default here is don't do anything. So if you leave it at the default, it still won't work, right? So you do have to specifically say, download the content and run it, even in a fallback scenario, right? Well, now let's go look at it and see how it works and how it's different. So I'll go back, and here's the other thing. In a, in a lab like this, it's really cool. The reason I have three deployments is because it allows me to set these three up, have them staged for you. If I were to have one deployment and changing these to match, the given, it would take policy updates, it would take a lot more uh, time, so it's useful that some of these other settings, like enabling fallback, changing boundary groups, all that, don't require a policy update, so it, it helps stream it along. All right, so let's go, uh, go back to the client and see how this works. <clears throat> so here is my fallback scenario, and again, I'm gonna install this thing. First time it should fail, and it did and retrying, I'm gonna go install it. We're downloading, everything is good to go. Right, installing. So now I'm gonna go back to the catalog. I'm not gonna walk you through the entire process now because you've seen the management point, you've seen you know, building the content out. I'm just gonna take you directly to the content request and the reply and show it to you. So let's go into my catalog, and I'm gonna search up from the bottom for reply, because it should be there. And there it is. And I'm just gonna take you directly to this blob. Right here, this XML that came back. Notice that now this has changed. It works, the user has no idea. Right, it worked exactly, it might be slower depending on where they are, right? User has no idea, it works. You know, because now this tag tells you, I'm not local, I'm not using a preferred DP, I'm using a fallback DP Maybe you want that, maybe it's expected, maybe it's not, All right? So again, more information. The rest of it is largely the same, but it illustrates the difference, All right? All right, so let's, uh, let's move on to demo number three. So again, I need to come back and clean up, oops, I need to come back and clean up my, uh, my lab in just a minute. Okay, let me shift over to the PowerPoint again. So here's scenario number four. This is how my lab will be rearranged. So again, I have, this is what, what I call distribute on demand. It's really preferred DP using a preferred DP for deploying content. So think of this scenario. You have a client that is on your network and you know, maybe boundaries are misconfigured, I don't know, whatever, maybe it's roaming to another site, whatever the case may be, now it's within the boundaries of another boundary group, right? And maybe the, your, your client's gonna request content that you did not plan to deploy everywhere, right? But if a client from another location asks for the content, you want to make it available to them, you just don't want to proactively deploy it. Or maybe it's one of those things that you just don't wanna deploy anywhere and you want clients to be able to request it and you know, deploy it, whatever, right? So basically you want to enable on-demand deployment. This is very much like uh, branch distribution points from 2007, the way this works, right? So the point is a client could be within the boundary groups of a defined boundary or of a, of a given DP, but the DPs that are serving that boundary group don't have the content. Well, you want to allow that content to be made available in that scenario so you can enable when that client asks for the content to roll that content down proactively to the DPs. I'll show you what that looks like from a manual run perspective, but you could also you know, kind of do this in an automated way. 
even for required apps, if a client happens to fall within boundaries and that DP in the boundaries doesn't have the content. So here's the way I'm going to shuffle my lab. So notice, again, PR2 does not have any boundaries. The boundary, in fact, that the client is on now is going to be assigned to, to PR1. So even though my client is on PR2 and assigned to PR2, it's now within the boundaries of PR1. So again, this could be kind of a remote roaming scenario, maybe, similar, right? Or local, whatever, regional roaming, put, it, put the tag on there that you want. But it's definitely kind of a traveling scenario. It's remote from its home site, right? So this illustrates what, I, again, should be on demand, but it also illustrates where maybe, you know, having boundaries that uh, are in your boundary group to, to facilitate clients in different locations can, can work and so on, and, and there's other things we could do, but we'll stay with that. So now I've got to go set this up in my lab. So let's shift over and I'll adjust the lab and show you a couple of things. So the first thing I need to do is clean up my lab to make sure that I don't have it here. Let's get rid of this. All right, the other thing that I want to do real quick is show you and let you take a mental snapshot of something. Right, first, let me do a removal. All right, and uh, then, oops. Let me show you the uh, Config Manager applet. So take a mental snapshot of this picture. You see the site code. You see the assigned site, right, exactly as we would expect. Site code's PR2. Assigned site is the PR2 site server, right? No problem. Take a mental snapshot. I'm going to tell the client that rich copy is no longer there. Good to go. Now, I have to go back to the site for just a minute and make some adjustments. So now, on the uh, boundary groups, I need to come in here and move my boundary range to this boundary group. So I'll add it. Good enough. Okay, the other thing that I need to do is make sure that my distribution point is in this boundary group for PR1, and it is. And then here's the other thing. My goal for this demo is to have content roll down to this DP, but I'm not going to put it there. So to make sure that I'm not cheating, let's go to this uh, <clears throat> DP and look for content. And I should see the distribute on demand version of rich copy. It's not here. So the only way it will be here is if the client's request forces it to be deployed there on demand. So we'll come back and check that here in a bit. Okay, the next thing I need to do before I actually do the test is I need to restart my client service just to allow it to adjust and realize that the boundaries it's on have changed. So we'll take a minute, let it stop and restart. This would happen naturally, but I'm just gonna force it along. All right, and then See if it's happened yet. Not yet. It'll be there in a minute. Might have to restart it again. This is the part where I need to have uh, some distraction or some people up dancing or something like that. Yeah, can you come to a mic? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you come to a mic? <laughs> sorry, what about log level when I use debugging? So you can change the size of the log. What I see more often is that you change the max log history retention. So either one. 
six or one half does the other to me. You know, I, I probably would go with additional logs versus just making the, the current ones huge. I would want to have, you know, maybe three or four, whatever. Yeah, good question. Okay. All right, so this is adjusted now. So let me zoom this in. So notice the difference, right? So I told you, that, yeah, I asked you to take a mental snapshot. This is pretty much exactly the same, except now you have this interesting thing called a resident management point, right? If you had a secondary site, which you don't need secondary sites most of the time in 2012, sorry, personal little soapbox. Um, if you had a secondary site, it would be a proxy management point. But the point of this is, just by looking at the, the applet for the config manager client, it's telling you, I'm not in my home site. I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not in the management point of my home site. I'm in a different boundary scenario, okay? So remember when I said that, that boundaries are used with an asterisk for management point lookup? This is what I'm talking about, right? If you're at your home site, so the question has come up a lot. Can I use boundary groups to tell clients which of my management points within a site to use? The answer is no, because within a site, we consider all the management points peers, and it's kind of a random lookup once you get through the lookup uh, logic, which I'll, go, I'll tell you about in a minute. However, if your client is within the boundaries of another site's management point, we're going to use it, just like we always have, right? But it makes sense. We want to use local resources where we can. So that's the point. We're going to use our local management point here for PR1, even though we're assigned to PR2, to locate the content if it's available. Right? All right. Now, so let's go try to run this content. So like before, the first time I try to run this thing, it's going to fail. You launch Software Center. And what would you expect it to do the second time I try to run it? Any guesses? Fail? Okay, we'll see. So I'm gonna try to run this thing, and failure. Now let's run it again, and fail. Why? Because it's not on the DP yet, right? It's not there, we didn't allow fallback. We don't have it on our preferred DP, so we can't run it. The only thing we can do is hope that because distribute on demand's turned on, we're going to see it roll downhill to my DP, and then at some point in the future, I can run it. Now, obviously, that's me as a user trying to run it, but you know, it would work the same way if you had a required app that was just trying to run and it couldn't, and then we go into a retry cycle and that kind of thing. All right. All right. So let's trace this and see what happened. Again, I'm going to take you to uh, the logs that uh, we've already seen and show you how it works. So here's the client log, and here's CAS. So I'm going to go to the bottom, and I'm going to search up for reply. And up. And notice the difference. Here, I do, in fact, get a reply. I don't get any DPs. Here's a great indication. So I mentioned there are some scenarios where you just don't have access to the source. You can't find content to run a deployment. Here's a great indication of one of those scenarios. If you, if you see a reply from your content request, but you don't have con, a DP returned, either you don't have the content deployed to a DP, or you're not in the boundaries of a DP that allows you to get the content. And you're going to come back with a, re a reply that is empty, just like this. All right? So the client has nowhere to go. Well, in this case, we know that we've, we've told it, uh, hopefully, to distribute on demand. So let's chase this up. So let's go up to the management point on um, our primary. This time we're going to use primary one, right? Because primary one is the management point we're using. Right here. Come on. So I should see. Uh, near the bottom of my log for my MP underscore location, I should see a request to distribute on demand. 
here. Come on, open. All right. And here it is, right? So right over here, just at the bottom, we're going to go run the stored procedure mp get content dp info protected. We get nothing, right? So we see no locations found. And then the third line from the bottom, hey, we are going to ask on demand by creating a demand file for this content to be deployed to our DPs, right? You see that. Now, this demand file gets created and it gets processed by distribution manager at the site. So let's go see that happen. So if I go back, Here's config manager, logs. This is my primary site one. Again, why? Because I'm within the boundaries of primary site one. Go down to distribution manager. And let's search up for demand. And there it is. Right? So we see that, hey, we've got a demand file, we're processing it, we're gonna start processing this package, we're gonna send it down to our DP, everything is good. Right? So at this stage, if I've given it enough time, and I think I have, I should actually see the content on that DP. So let's check it. Content. And there it is. It's proactively been added. I didn't do a thing. And now when I go to the client, I should be able to run this no problem. Retry, off we go, running, install it, right? Exactly like it should. Now, here's something to understand. I showed you the, the default option. I showed you the uh, fallback option. I showed you the distribute on demand or preferred DP option you have to choose one or the other. You cannot have a distribution point that's configured for fallback and also receive content as a preferred DP. Why? If you configure a DP for fallback, you're telling Config Manager this DP is going to serve the request of clients potentially from anywhere, right? So we don't then know, should this DP get content because it's within this boundary group, should it not, we don't know, right? Whereas if you don't have it enabled for fallback, that be then becomes a preferred source location for your clients that are in this boundary group on those boundaries, and it can receive content on demand. It's really up to you how you want to operate. It gives you a couple of options, right? All right, so let's, let's wrap this thing up because I'm getting close on time, it looks like and come back. So I mentioned, I've already mentioned the nuances with um, how we find remote MPs that we can work with. Here's really the lookup within a site, within a given site, here's how we look up and choose management points. Right, this isn't really boundary related, but it just kind of puts a, a cherry on top of the, the Sunday. So we prefer to use MPs that are within our local forest first versus remote forests. Then we prefer to use MPs that are enabled for SSL versus those that are just uh, normal uh, port 80 traffic. From there, we treat every MP the same. It's just totally random lookup from there within a site. So the only time that boundaries get leveraged for finding an MP is in that roaming type of scenario where you're going to a different site, right? All right, so with that, um, wrapping a couple of things up, these are just uh, some, so I'm a, a premier field engineer. I didn't mention that, I don't think, at the first. Uh, in the services side of Microsoft, there are several of my peers that have done sessions. Some of them have finished already, but uh, if it's interesting to you, this is a list of those. You can go back and watch them on demand if you haven't seen them, uh, whatever. Also, um, here's my blog entry. So some of these things you'll see on my blog. Uh, my other session will be there as well. And, uh, such. If you haven't seen my blog, you can take a look at that for some information after MMS. And then certainly, uh, we want to hear from you as customers. This is all about you and making sure that you're getting good information from MMS, useful information. So please let us know how you felt about MMS in general, this session specifically. I really value that feedback. Um, as I speak, I want to make sure that what I do is very valuable to you guys. So please take time and fill that out. Beyond that, 
uh, we're done for today. If you have any questions, please come up. Thank you guys for attending MMS, and have a good day.